page, I'm Suzanne Lucy from Page 158 Books, and I'm pleased to announce Stephen Epstein is back here with us. His last book did really well, and he has another true crime book out today. Um, Stephen B. Epstein is a litigation partner with Pointer School LLP in Raleigh, North Carolina. And he has been practicing law for 30 years, and he's only 35, so that's weird. Um, he's tried many jury and non-jury trials in courtrooms throughout North Carolina and has argued numerous appeals. Since 2015, Epstein's legal practice has focused primarily on family law. His first book, Murder on Birchleaf Drive, the true story of the Michelle Young murder case, is done really well. And I had people talk to me and stop me to talk about that book. It was a really well done book and you are so personable. Your personality came through in that book and I really enjoyed it. So I can't wait to get my hands on this one. The second book is called Evil at Lake Seminole, the shocking true story surrounding the disappearance of Mike Williams. It was released in June. Mr. Epstein lives in Raleigh with his wife and children, and one by one, they are leaving the home, going off to college and living their lives, but they will be back, Steve. I just want to warn you. Thanks for the introduction. Yeah. So what, what prompted you to write this book? Like, how did you get the idea? Uh, the ideas I talk about in the preface uh, came during a podcast uh, that I was listening to as I was driving in between my son finishing his first high school football game um, at, in a away game and getting back to his locker room at Broughton High School in Raleigh. Uh, and that was about a 45 minute wait, perfect amount of time to listen to a true crime podcast. And it was at that time that I was just starting to tinker with the idea of writing another book. And I heard a podcast on this story and was captivated from probably the first five minutes of the podcast and knew by the next day that I was going to write this book. Wow. Tell us a little bit about the background of this. Uh, well, it, uh, the, the beginning of the book takes place at a place called Lake Seminole, which is a man-made reservoir. It was made in order to uh, create power. Uh, so there was a dam that was created in the 1950s, and it filled a fairly large area with water that used to be uh, fields, uh, farms, and things like that. Um, and it was a place that became a very um, well-known place for uh, folks to go hunt and fish. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, the victim in our story, Mike Williams, was somebody that loved to hunt and fish, uh, particularly duck hunting. And uh, the, the southern tip of Lake Seminole, which is uh, at the very northern tip of Florida, straddling the, the Florida-Georgia line, um, is a, a well-known area for duck hunting. And uh, he would go there frequently, and he went there this morning, December 16, 2000, um, and he never came home. Uh, by all accounts, Mike Williams was as salt of the earth type of guy as you could ever imagine. Uh, he was a family man, he was a loving son to his mother, his father had died, a couple years before. Um, he had an older brother. They grew up in very modest circumstances. He actually lived in a mobile home with his mother, father, and brother. Um, and his mom ran a babysitting service or a daycare service out of that mobile home and continued to do that actually until COVID-19 hit uh, just a few months ago. Um, and uh, he fell in love with this girl in high school named Denise uh, Merrill. And uh, that high school sweetheart uh, was the person who was his wife at the time um, he went missing on December 16, 2000. And that was the eve of their sixth wedding anniversary. Oh, wow. So they always suspect a spouse. Is that what happens? Uh, well, if you read the book, you'll learn <laughs> all of the details. And uh, the, I will say that the story ends with the trial of his spouse, Denise Williams, for okay. Mike's murder. Mm-hmm. Wow. Well, I read a little bit about this and it sounds intriguing. So how did you, did you, were you able to go there? Were you able to meet the people before you wrote the book? Uh, well, meet, I met a lot of people by telephone, but in addition to that, I did go there. The front cover of the book, which I'll hold up to my camera, is a picture of Lake Seminole at sunrise in December of 2019. And I actually took that picture with my iPhone standing on the shoreline. Uh, so yes, I did go and I met with several folks while I was there, but I've also spoken on the phone uh, countless times to some of the central characters in the story. And that's a huge difference between my first book where I had no access to people because no one wanted to talk to me and my second book where I had a lot of access to friends and family. Why do you think that is? Because you had that, you know, I, I was, I wrote a book and 
Well, the, the huge difference was the mom in the first book, Linda Fisher, uh, wanted to do everything she could to protect uh, there. There was also a, a young child, uh, Cassidy, um, who uh, was literally at the murder scene uh, when her mom was killed. Uh, they, they just didn't, they didn't want anything to happen that would give Cassidy more information about that, that horrible evening that led to both the, the death of her mother and the imprisonment of her father. Uh, in this book, uh, Cheryl Williams, uh, as you read the book, you'll learn, she wanted the whole world to know what had happened to her son. And so she was very cooperative and helpful uh, and actually led me to a whole lot of other people who were very cooperative and helpful. And I learned a whole lot about Mike Williams. So I was able to flesh out the characters in this story a lot more than I was able to flesh out the characters in Murder on Birchleaf Drive. Oh, well, I can't, honestly, I really can't wait to get into that because you're a great writer. Um, so do you, is that your genre, your go-to is true crime? Uh, apparently, I, I've written two books in true crime and I think I'm kind of hooked on it, so yeah. Yeah, were you always like that? Because I mean, there's always those Dateline shows and all those shows, where, is that something that's always interested you? The, the shows, not so much, but I have read a number of true crime books uh, from the time I was fairly young. Joe McGinnis was a favorite of mine, uh, Jerry Bledsoe. Um, I, I was not an Anne Rule reader or lover, but um, I've heard people compare my writing to Anne Rule, which is, of course, the highest compliment. Um, so I, I've read probably 15 or 20 true crime books over the course of my life. And the, the, the Jason Young case was I knew so many of the principles involved that I just became very attracted to the story, not necessarily because it was true crime, but because of all the people that I knew that were involved. Um, but as I wrote that book, I think I realized that I, I kind of know how to put a story together that relates to a criminal act and a criminal case. So to the extent I write for the true crime books, I suspect that every single one of them, like my first two, is gonna end in a trial of somebody who is either convicted or not convicted of killing the victim. Well, you work in family law. <laughs> you don't see the true crime in that. Did you ever think of switching over to that? No, I'm not, I'm not interested at all in um, criminal work. However, I will say that family law, A, there was a whole chapter in my last book that was very much devoted to family law because there was a family law case in the first book. There wasn't in this one. But if you think about it, the people that I meet with regularly as a family law attorney um, are people who are in marriages or relationships that are dissolving and typically dissolving pretty badly. Mm -hmm. Well, a true crime story is exactly that, except one step it, more. <laughs> it dissolves really, really badly. And to yeah. me, that's what fascinates me is what is how two people can, who can you know, fall in love and decide to spend their lives together can end their relationship in a way where one of them is dead and the other, in many of these cases, is tried for killing them. I remember being young and first married and there was so many of those murder cases like Pamela Smart and that couple that the woman was pregnant and he jumped off the bridge. And I thought like, oh, this, this poor man can't get through the holidays because his wife and unborn son are dead. And then you found out it was him that did it. And I think you always feel so bad for them, you know, for the family and everybody involved. And then it turns out, like you said, like here are these people that are so in love and they're having a baby and everybody's happy but there's so much going on inside. You know, and that's that the other thing as a divorce lawyer, I'll tell you is that, you know, what goes, I mean, people look at married couples, you know, walking their dog or, or whatever in the community, going to the grocery store, uh, going to a sporting event, and they have no idea what goes on be yeah. behind the scenes in the uh, comfortable surroundings of one's own home. And there are a lot of people who live double lives um, that uh, their spouses don't know about in, uh, in true crime cases, that tends to be true, is that um, the, the perpetrator of the crime is living a double life. It was certainly true in both of these books. Uh, so there's so much that goes on in a relationship that is oftentimes not what meets the eye. Uh, yeah. And that is a, a very common theme in true crime stories. Is there something that you find with the two um, suspects in these two books that like there should have been warning signs ahead of ahead of time that this person could do this or like certain traits that the person had that yeah they, they were different but you know it's it, hindsight's 2020 and uh especially with this particular case um you know the the people who ultimately were um found by law enforcement to have committed this crime were mike williams best friend and his wife uh, who by the way later got married to one another 
Oh, uh, really? There were all kinds of signs that uh, poor Mike Williams didn't see in front of his own face about both of them. Um, and the same was true with Jason Young there. You know, if you read that book, there were some behaviors that he engaged in over the years uh, that Michelle, you have to wonder if she was a very smart woman, why on earth was she with, with this guy? Yeah. Uh, now, none of them, you know, were that apparent that were heading down a path toward murder, but you had to wonder why she was with a guy like that. Um, and in this story, you know, one of the most compelling things that I found was Mike Williams would be at work and he, he, would, he worked 70, 75 hours a week and he worked his rear end off in order to provide for his family. And yet his wife, who was only working part time after the birth of their daughter, um, would need her gas pump and she would drive to a gas station you know, across the street from where Mike worked and she would call him on the cell phone saying, I'm at the gas station. And he would race down the stairs from his second floor office in, his, um, in the building he worked in, get into his truck, drive out to the gas station and get there and would go to the pump and he would pump her gas. And she expected that of him and he did that routinely. Um, you have to wonder no. if somebody doesn't see some kind of sign that they're married to someone that's at least strange, if not, there's something a little fishy about them. Very manipulative. Yes. You know? Wow. So, <laughs> did you want to read from your book now? I would love to. I would okay. love to. So I'm going to read from chapter one. I'm going to just pick out little pieces of chapter one. Uh, chapter one is called Duck Hunting. Uh, and I'm going to pick up with Jerry Michael Williams, where I introduce him to the story. Jerry Michael Williams, a 31-year-old real estate appraiser from Tallahassee, was an avid outdoorsman seizing every opportunity his jam-packed schedule permitted to go deep sea fishing or duck hunting. He found hiding in a duck blind just before sunrise soothing to his soul, a pleasant diversion from his long hours at work. Lake Seminole was one of his favorite places to hunt. He had been making the hour-long pilgrimage to its southwestern shore, just north of Sneeds, Florida, since he was a teenager proudly bagging hundreds of ducks since his first visit. It was well before dawn when Mike left home on Saturday, December 16, 2000, his small hunting boat filled with duck hunting supplies and gear fastened to the trailer. That late fall day just happened to be the eve of his sixth wedding anniversary. He and his wife, Denise, had been sweethearts at Tallahassee's North Florida Christian School since their freshman year. Now, more than 15 years later, they were the proud parents of a 19-month-old daughter named Ansley. Both mother and daughter were fast asleep as Mike began his journey northwest toward Sneeds. He was expected home around noon. When he hadn't returned by 2 o'clock p.m., Denise called her father, Warren Merrill, who lived nearby with her mom. She explained that she and Mike had plans to leave early that afternoon for the Gibson Inn at Apalachicola Bay for their anniversary celebration. Mike had arranged for Denise's sister, Deanna, to care for Ansley during their overnight trip. As the drive to the Seaside Hotel would take nearly two hours, their dinner reservations were already in jeopardy. Denise told her dad Mike had gone to the lake by himself, which was a little unusual as he typically hunted with a friend. She told them she had called Mike's cell phone several times to no avail and didn't understand why he hadn't gotten home yet, or at least called, especially with their out-of-town anniversary celebration mapped out so meticulously. Something doesn't seem right, she said. She asked her father, if he wouldn't mind heading to the lake to investigate. Skipping forward a couple of pages, Nick Williams, Mike's older brother, spent nearly every Saturday with their mom, often taking her around town on her errands. December 16, 2000 was no exception. That morning, they got lost, excuse me, that morning they got lost in some last minute Christmas shopping. Cheryl Williams was eager to find just a few more presents for her only grandchild. At one store, she eyed a shiny red toy wagon she believed Ansley would enjoy pulling behind her. Cheryl borrowed Nick's cell phone to check with Denise to make sure her daughter-in-law would approve. 
The wagon sounded like a good gift, Denise assured her mother-in-law. Cheryl sought out Mike's thoughts too, but Denise reminded her that he had gone hunting at Lake Seminole that morning. He was due back about noon, she said. When they got back to her home following lunch and a quick stop at the grocery store, Cheryl told Nick she was heading out for an afternoon stroll, a routine she began shortly after her husband Jerry passed away two years before. She walked down the hill about two miles to Lake Ammonia, one of the places Mike had learned to hunt as a youngster, then circled back toward home. When she walked through the door at about three o'clock p.m., Nick was extremely distraught, tears rolling down his cheeks. What's wrong, his mother asked, puzzled by his change in demeanor. Denise just called, he told her. Mike's missing. What do you mean he's missing, she asked quizzically. Denise had told him, Nick explained, that Mike hadn't returned home from his hunting trip at Lake Seminole. She was so worried, he said, she called her father, who was already on his way to the lake to investigate. Nick decided to jump in his car and head there himself. Skipping ahead a couple of more pages. More people arrived as the distressing news spread, including Mike's best friend since the ninth grade, Brian Winchester, and his father, Marcus, both of whom were financial planners and life insurance agents. Though the official search was suspended at midnight until daybreak, Brian and his dad remained in their boat, trolling and scanning the water into the early morning hours, guided by the headlights on their foreheads. At about 2.30 a.m., Marcus spotted something against the tall reeds along the western shoreline, no more than 75 yards south of the dirt ramp near Mike's Bronco. As the father and son edged closer, the first significant question about Mike's disappearance had its answer. They spotted his 13-foot Janoo, a canoe-shaped motorboat, sitting upright behind some stumps protruding above the water. Yet no sign of Mike. Their calls for him were met with eerie silence. When the FWC, and that's the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, when the FWC morning crew arrived a few hours later, Marcus and Brian led officer David Arnett to the boat. The wildlife officer had to fish through two inches of rainwater pooled inside to inventory its contents. 39 decoys, an anchor, two life jackets, a paddle, an aluminum push pole, a plastic ammunition box, and a 12 gauge three inch Beretta over under shotgun still zipped up in its case, lying next to the driver's seat. The throttle on the five horsepower Go Devil motor was flipped to the on position, nearly full throttle. The fuel tank was filled almost to capacity, a sign the boat couldn't have been in the water long before whatever unfortunate mishap took place. I'm gonna skip ahead some more. The afternoon of December 18th offered a brief glimmer of hope. A volunteer poked something with his PVC pole that seemed unusual. But when a diver went down to get a better look, the suspicious object turned out to be nothing more than a spongy, dense patch of hydrilla. It was so cold that afternoon, 30 degrees with a wind chill of about 20, the diver's underwater breathing apparatus froze just as he resurfaced. Excitement swelled yet again on December 19th, when one of the bottom finders signaled an unusually dense object on the lake bottom. Divers investigated the spot the following day, but spirits were dashed again when they resurfaced. The suspicious object was nothing more than a thick log. On the morning of December 30th, another ray of hope emerged a camouflage patterned bucket hat seemingly appeared out of nowhere, hung up in some hydrilla near the island across the shoreline from where Mike's truck was found. FWC officer Alton Renew plucked it out of the water, shocked it hadn't been detected before then, and brought it to the FWC tent for closer inspection. The hat appeared almost new. It wasn't slimy or covered in sediment from the lake nothing at all to suggest it had been in the water for two weeks. 
Brian Winchester showed up at the tent that morning and told Renew the hat looked very familiar. The next day, Brian was back in the tent with a framed five by seven photo to show Renew. In the picture, Mike appeared to be wearing the very same hat. Brian recounted how Mike had bought the hat over the Thanksgiving weekend when the two had gone to Arkansas together on a hunting trip. Thus, by year end, searchers had recovered Mike's vehicle, boat trailer, Janu motorboat, duck hunting supplies, a shotgun, and now Mike's bucket hat. But still, they were no closer to solving the nettlesome mystery of what had happened to Mike. On January 8th, investigators discovered three different pieces of soft tissue at the end of a concrete culvert a quarter mile north of the dirt ramp. They wondered whether, whether the remains were Mike's. But when the medical examiner's officer, I'm sorry, when the medical examiner's office took a closer look, it was determined that the small pieces of flesh more likely belonged to a deer, pig, or large dog. Fish and wildlife officers felt certain that Mike's body, once it filled with gases as it decomposed, would eventually float to the surface, as had occurred with each of the 80 people who had drowned at Lake Skull prior to December 2000. They assured Mike's family and friends his body would inevitably be recovered. But as the days turned into weeks, no body surfaced. Mike's best friend, Brian, made the trek to Lake Seminole nearly every day, becoming more and more distraught as time marched on. Yet each time searchers found a promising clue, he froze up, unable to deal with the prospect of having to see Mike's body being pulled out of the water. On more than one occasion, he asked Mike's coworker, Brett Ketchum, to drive him down the road for a cup of coffee while a new discovery was explored. I just don't wanna be here when they find Mike, he explained. Brian was so gripped by emotion, he wept openly, leading Ketchum, who barely knew him, to embrace him for comfort. Though Denise herself never made the hour-long journey to Lake Seminole to join in the search, her father Warren was there every day, sun up to sundown, as determined to find Mike as anyone. Warren provided his daughter daily briefings on the frenetic activity at the lake. He had posters made with Mike's picture, the word missing scrawled across the top, which were fastened to trees and telephone poles for miles along the shoreline and throughout Sneeds, where many hunters and fishermen lived or stopped for bites to eat on their way to and from the lake. Yet Warren's weeks-long devotion to finding Mike didn't lead to a single promising clue. By late January, Mike's mother Cheryl had grown so frustrated by the lack of answers from the FWC, she retained a private search firm from Alabama named Montgomery County Search and Rescue Inc., or MCSAR for, for short. On January 26th, MCSAR deployed a sophisticated canine unit and underwater dive team. The company had three well-trained German Shepherd cadaver dogs thoroughly search the area from late January through February 11th. The dogs alerted in several disparate locations, leading the head of the team to conclude that the alerts and indications of my dogs were consistent with human remains. MCSAR's dive team leader reached an even more blood-curdling conclusion, hypothesizing that, based on the abundant hydrilla in the search area and the presence of numerous alligators, the alligators have dismembered and stored Mike's remains in a location that we would not be able to find, possibly a den or maybe under a log near the den. That, he believed, explained why the cadaver dogs had alerted, even though no human remains had been found. Yet in the FWC's February, 20, February 23rd, 2001 report, the agency stated that after 735 hours of searching, 400 by boat, 285 by land, and 50 by air, from December 16th through February 10th, it was unable to determine what had happened to Mike. And those figures didn't include the thousands of hours contributed 
by volunteer searchers. In the last paragraph of its report, the FWC stated, nothing in the investigative search and rescue efforts has produced any definitive evidence of a boating accident or a fatality as of this date. Mr. Williams is still missing. On February 11, 2001, hundreds of Mike's friends, family members, co-workers, fellow church parishioners, as well as officers and deputies who had searched so tirelessly for nearly two months in inhospitable conditions, gathered at Thomasville Road Baptist Church in Tallahassee for a memorial service arranged by Denise's family. A large swath of Mike's high school graduating class was there, including Brian Winchester. As a montage of images of Mike flashed across a large screen, showing the progression of his life from childhood to marriage and fatherhood, even the burly wildlife officers, most of whom had never met him, began to weep. A profound sense of anguish and sadness filled the sanctuary for a life cut short in its prime, a daughter left to grow up without the love and guidance of her father, and a wife suddenly widowed at age 30. Denise was an emotional wreck. When the service ended, she had to be helped out of the church, unable to put one foot in front of the other without assistance. Even though the event wasn't officially advertised as a funeral, very few in attendance had any delusions Mike would someday turn up alive. By then, the theory that he had accidentally fallen overboard, drowned in his waders, and been picked apart and hidden in a, I'm sorry, and been picked apart and stored in a hidden lair by alligators seemed as likely as any. And that's the end of chapter one. Wow, that's chapter one. <laughs> chapter one. That's, those Don't are you pieces. Want to, like go down that rabbit hole and just like keep going. I, I want to like know about the pictures and and see everything with this. So, wow. And there are and lots that, of pictures in the book. Are there? Oh, yes. I can't. I really can't wait to read it. Thank you. Do you realize like it was Christmas? They have a new baby. Like, what is going through anybody's mind to do that to somebody? It just does. It's horrible and it doesn't make sense. And well, I, because you said that and because you mentioned pictures, I have to show the last picture ever taken of Mike. Let's see if I can get it on the screen. It is this picture right there. They look like the perfect all-American family. Yeah, in fact, at the end of the book, I say this picture could well have been placed in the Christmas edition of Better Homes and Garden magazine. That was yeah. taken the Thursday afternoon before the Saturday morning that Mike perished. Wow. And you can see the smiling faces. Um, and that was the last picture ever taken of him. And that evening was the last time his mother and brother ever saw him. That's gutting. That There's no sense in that. And that's just not fair. You know, it's just, there's so many things. Do you think that's why people are intrigued with these stories? I, there are many reasons. I mean, the alligator, as, as you saw toward the end of, the, of, of yeah. that first chapter, the alligators made this. And by the way, the alligator has, he gets the back cover. <laughs> you took these pictures too. You did a great job. Actually, I found this one on the internet. Don't tell me. Oh, anybody. you did? <laughs> Say you took it. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see any alligators without that. I almost fell overboard though while I was in the boat. Oh, no. Uh, in literally the same spot where, as it turned out, Mike was killed. <sighs> Mike wow. was killed at Lake Seminole. Well, you're gonna have to find you're, you're gonna have to buy and read the book so you can figure out and learn all about the intricacies of this case because it's fascinating. It is. You said you weren't working on another book, but if we send you some podcasts, <laughs> I think you should. I've probably had on Facebook and otherwise, I've probably had over 20 suggestions for another story, which I haven't even let my ears open up at this point. Yeah, I we we were watching a genealogy one, and it has to do with um, the true true crime calm and. Do you ever, do you plan to go there and sell your book? The crime con conventions? It's funny because I think there was one in Orlando that was getting ready to happen just before COVID-19. If yeah. I got asked to attend, I would. I don't have any great interest to go unless I'm asked. It's a, it's a cult thing. Yeah. yeah, it is. Well, I can't thank you enough for being here and enticing us with that story. Um, does anybody have any questions you want to ask Stephen? And you have I, mean, I don't have any, I don't have any questions, but as I said, I live in Tallahassee. 
And so I knew the story, but the way you put it together really flowed and it was a lot easier to follow than even living through it, you know, because I didn't read all of the newspaper articles. I, of course, saw all the billboards. I didn't ever see her, the mom actually protesting, but I remember when Brian was arrested and I, and I remember when, when Denise was arrested, but the way you put it together just really it just really flowed and everything fit. And that's probably your lawyer background. I'm an attorney too. And I know we have to, you know, put things together that way, but I, I really enjoyed it. And again, even from that. living here, it was, it, it was enlightening for me. So. Thank you. You're a great writer. Like it's just like talking to you, you're factual, you, and you keep a pace going that wants you to keep going too. So that's, did you take, did you go to school for any of that or take a class in creative writing or at all? Not, a, not at all. And it wasn't until I was, you know, 54 that it, it became apparent that I was going to be a writer. So this, this yeah. was a, uh, a surprise to me more than surprise to anybody else. I did not know I was going to be a true crime writer. And for some reason, I was possessed to write the first book. And people at book signings told me I really needed to write another one. And yeah. Uh, that's probably why I was listening to that podcast because I was willing to entertain the idea because enough people had said you, you need to write another one. Yeah. Uh, I'm taking a pause, no matter how much people say you need to write a third one, but I am I will continue writing. Well, if you don't want to interfere with family time, I know some inside uh, the inside scoop from authors. They wake up at four. Oh gosh, much of this book was written before most people were awake, for sure. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, good. Um, welcome, Francine. Um, does anybody else have any other questions? And you said, Steve, that you could actually personalize books if you want us. We can I would be delighted to. So just let us know in the comments. Francine, where are you calling from? We can unmute you. She doesn't want to talk. That's okay. Gina, I know, is a true- Francine's from Tallahassee as well. Oh, is she? Francine lent me the book. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, so I've been, I, I have a Facebook page that's been very, very active. And my guess is that Lori and Francine probably at least either indirectly or directly found out about this through the Facebook page. Well, Francine found it and she lent the book to me. And I have been on the Facebook page. There was one picture there that had a woman in it that I know. And I need to figure out what her relationship is. She was wearing a, a little pin that had Mike Williams picture on it. So she somehow must know the family. Uh, you might be talking about my my website as opposed to the Facebook page. Oh, no. Yes, that, I'm sorry. That was the website. Yes. Okay. Yeah, and I'd have yeah. to know which picture you were talking about. Yeah. Who? You don't know who it is? Or who? I no, I know, the, I know a woman in the picture, but I don't know what her relationship is. She must have some relationship with the Williams family because she was wearing a button that had Mike's picture on it. I just haven't had a chance to talk to her since I saw the picture on the website. It could be Denise Tate Brogdon, who was Mike's first Denise and first girlfriend. Um, she's somebody who has uh, been very close to um, Cheryl. And, and it also could be um, Maria Denmark, who was six years old and one of the kids in Cheryl's care at the time Mike was killed. And she's been exceptionally close to Cheryl, uh, the, basically through the uh, nearly 20 years that Cheryl was fighting for justice. No, I'll find out. I'll give her a call and find out. <laughs> and I, I have I have pins myself. So when I was down there, I got my own pins. <laughs> so sad. Yeah, that's the one she was wearing. That that oh, this that's ju justice for Mike. Yeah, that's the one. That's the picture that was on all the billboards around town. Well, it's also the picture on the front cover of my book. Right. Yeah. Because even though that's not the best picture of Mike, and everybody agreed with that, that picture is so iconic because of the billboards, because of the posters, because of her picket signs, that um, if anybody knew anything about the story, they would see that picture and know exactly what it was about. Yeah. And, there's, and, and so, Sue, there's so much about Cheryl Williams that, you, you, that we, we didn't even scrape the surface of learning about Cheryl Williams, but had this mother, uh, the, the, I think the most critical chapter in the book is called Persistence, Perseverance, Pursuit. Uh, and it's mostly about Cheryl. And had she not done what she did for 17 years, uh, that nobody would have given a second thought to this have been having been an accident. Can you even imagine? 
the anguish as a parent, you just know like your, your child's a half an hour late from curfew or whatever. You're going crazy, but 17 years. It took her three and a half years to, to get anybody to in, even investigate it. Ugh. And then she wrote over 2000 letters to the governor of Florida. She paid for several billboards out of a little bit of money she had. She paid for ads in the Tallahassee Democrat and on and on and on the things that this woman did to try to get somebody to listen. And all the while told she was crazy. She had people come up to her and spit at her, tell her she was crazy, tell her to go home, tell her her son was dead um, and that uh, he had drowned and to just get over it. Uh, and this is what she endured for all of those years. And she finally got to sit on the witness stand in December of 2018 for all of about 20 minutes. And that was the length of her testimony at trial in a trial that for some bewildering reason lasted only about two days. Um, and uh, fortunately, she, she got a measure of justice through that trial. Well, hopefully, I mean, you don't get over something like that. It doesn't make you feel good, but at the same time, like she can have peace that, you know, oh. Well, she doesn't have peace and here's why. Because at the time that she was getting the investigation going, her daughter-in-law, Denise, who was then uh, pretty much engaged to Brian Winchester, who you heard me talk, talking about, who was Mike's best friend, uh, they came to her home and said, if you don't stop this investigation, you will never see Ansley again. And uh, she said, I, I, I wouldn't stop this investigation even if I could, and I can't. Uh, and they held true to their word. She never saw Ansley again. And to this day, Ansley could not be more poisoned and alienated against her. And she's still completely aligned with her mom who's in prison uh, and her mom's sisters. And uh, she probably will never have a, another word with this child again, who was every bit as much the love of her life as she was the love of Mike's life at the time Mike perished. That is so heartbreaking, that poor girl. Oh, there's so much wrong with this. There is. Well, everybody, I hope you all read um, his first book and you can do signed copies. I need um, some more books for our store. And anybody other questions? I don't want to cut this off. I just want to take, not take too much more of your time. But if you need a signed copy, let us know and we can mail you one. I need one. I'm going to get one for Gina and who has already said that. To our best friends. No. <laughs> so, well, thank you so much. And we will be re-airing this on our Facebook page at page 158 books. And Steve, good luck with everything. And thank I, you. Thank you, Sue. Thank you, Dave. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Shout out to page 158 books. Just hang in there. Yes. Thank you, Stephen. Thank, <laughs> thank you. Thank you all. Have a thank great night. Stay safe.